McQuistian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Well, hello, I'm Dennis McQuistion, and this may be the year of China. We've done so many programs on China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, all the military issues, the COVID issues. And Jim, you're going to talk to us and introduce our guests and about what we're going to talk about with young China today. I sure am. And you're right. We've covered so much on China, but this is a topic that is really, I think people are going to enjoy because it's such a different perspective. As you know, China has a population, uh, a very large population, and its population is 700 million for people under the age of 40. Now, just to put that into perspective, that's more young people than there are in North America, Europe, and the Middle East combined. So we really do need to know what they're thinking, what they want, and how they see the world. And to do that, we are joined by Zach Dykwald. He's a graduate of Columbia University. He grew up in the Bay Area. Then he spent the last several years in China where he's gained just wonderful fluency in Mandarin. We had the chance to hear him speak just a moment ago. And during that time, he was researching and writing this book, Young China. He's the principal of the Young China Group. It's a consulting firm that advises clients, as he says, from the ground up. And we have a special guest joining us, and that's a student from the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm going to let Zach introduce him because he'll do a much better job than I will saying his name. Well, Zach, great to so have much. you with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I, and I have the distinct pleasure of not only joining this program today, but being joined by Jin Ho-jun, uh, who I just met. But uh, Jin Ho-jun also goes by the English name of Jeremy, which I think will probably be a little bit more convenient for us today. Well, and, and, and Jeremy, as I mentioned, he's a graduate student. He's been in the States for four years, earning a master's degree in accounting and information technology. And moreover, he just finished passing all four parts of the CPA exam, and he's planning to return back to China pretty soon at the end of this month. Dennis, why don't you get us started? I will. And uh, Jeremy, welcome to the program. We just confirmed that he's a former student of mine. And in, in <laughs> spite of that, he's done really well, which I'm <laughs> delighted about. Uh, so yeah. glad to have you, uh, Jeremy. My uh, pleasure. Zach, give that viewer some sort of perspective on the China demographic issue overall, and then you can bring it down into the young China perspective. Absolutely. So demographers love to say that demography is destiny, right? And if that is the case, China has long been tampering with its own fate. Uh, so one of the things we don't necessarily appreciate is that China had the largest baby boom in human history. Between 1950 and 1980, China's population increased from 540 million people, so only half a billion, uh, to 1980, uh, all the way up to 980 million people, an increase of 440 million people. That's more than the entire population of the United States. Now, on the back end of that massive baby boom, China engineered the world's largest baby bust with the creation of the one-child policy. And so you have a demographic pyramid, um, you know, a lot of young people and very few old people, which is what China has been traditionally effectively turning itself on its head, as there's also been an incredible longevity revolution. So in China today, you have this upside down pyramid of four grandparents for every two parents for every one child, uh, which poses an enormous amount of problems uh, and is really pushing the... Um, it's really the impetus for a variety of, of policy shifts in China, a uh, variety of social tensions uh, and cultural tensions in China, and really amounting to a huge amount of pressure on the bottom of that pyramid, these young people who are, who are faced with the task of, okay, how do, we, how do we support our country going forward? How do we support our family going forward? How do we support ourselves going forward? And you know, try to make ourselves happy along the way. Uh, with that being said, this so-called small population. Um, there's, four, there's over 400 million millennials in China. 
So millennials alone, I'm a millennial in, a, in the United States, there's 80 million of us. So there's five X more young people in China uh, than we have in the United States today with increasing economic and political clout, not just in China, but also on the world stage. Why is it important for that viewer to know more about China and particularly more about the young people in China? It's so important to understand specifically this young generation because they will be impacting your life and all of your viewers' lives personally. And so I don't care if they're in, in sort of global trade and business or wondering why you know, the price of, of gas or the, um, or the products on their shelves are looking a little bit different. I don't care if they're um, you know, interested in the global movie market or wondering why is it that when they bring their grandchild to see, the, to see a film, it's now featuring Shanghai as prominently as New York or Los Angeles. There's a shifting global uh, cultural gravity that's taking place right now. For many of us, it's uncomfortable. Um, but understanding this people first understanding or perspective on China will give you um, more insight into, into why the world is shifting the way it is, will make it more comfortable and easier for you. Uh, and will also create a tremendous amount of, frankly, opportunity. We always talk about competition. We rarely discuss collaboration. The opportunities for collaboration are vast. Zach, very briefly, remind all of us why the, the one-child policy was put in place, I think it was in, what, 1979, and recently lifted uh, about five or six years ago. Why was it put in place, and why was it lifted? So it was on the back end of, of this absolutely enormous baby boom. Remember, from the 1950s and 1980s, this was really the Mao era uh, in China, and he believed at the beginning of in the early 1950s that greater population meant, meant greater strength. Now, people took that quite seriously. And so the average births um, per family rose to around 5.5. Now, China has 20% of the world's population, but only 10% of the arable land, which means they, they simply didn't have enough food to support the population. They instituted the one-child policy to try to control that. It was a relatively brutal solution. Um, and so, you know, you had this one child policy be put into effect. It was recently relaxed, but still a lot of families in China are not having that second child and certainly not that third child today. Dennis, um, I'm, well, let me ask you this, Zach, one more question before I go to Dennis. This must put, as we see, so many people are leaving rural China and going to the large cities and God, there's so many of them. I want you to tell us how many are over X million. But that must put even more pressure, uh, pr pressure on the family unit. Oh, absolutely. And, and by the way, this demographic shift is really about pressure. I think when we think about young people in China, and particularly that single child, um, we have this, there's a reputation of what's called the little emperor. The idea is that this upside down pyramid works like a funnel. It's a funnel for resources. It's a funnel for love. It's a funnel for food. There's actually been an obesity issue in China over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, but it's also a funnel for pressure. The expectations of the family, the expectations to get ahead, the expectations to study abroad and have an, you know, a, an ascendant career all fall on that one child. So I often say that you know, for China's little emperors, heavy hangs the head that wears the crown. Because on one hand, they have tremendous opportunity. You know, in 1980, only 11% of the population of the adult population was high school educated. Today, one in three of all study abroad students in the United States come from China, a tremendous education revolution in the space of, of two generations. Now, on the other hand, the pressure to succeed, to get ahead, and ultimately to support that family unit also falls squarely on the shoulders of this young generation. All right, Zach, uh, I'm going to give uh, Jeremy a chance to respond to the question I'm going to ask you right now. And the question is sort of a dual question. First of all, the pressure that they have in studying, you write a lot about it in your book. They're uh, very good at studying. They're very good at education. There's a lot of competition there. And Jeremy, you, you were a great student, as were almost all of my Chinese students. And I, I think you're good at testing. And but did you was this something that was built into your culture, this idea that, that you've got to study hard and that you've really got to be good at testing and that the competition is fierce? Is that true? Well, you know, our country have a very long history for the testing. You know, even the UK government, they are civil servants. Uh, they learned that experience from our history, China history, how to elect 
the uh, high skilled people to join the civil servants. I believe right now, because of the high population, the most uh, fair way or equal way to get the uh, position in the whole system is the testing, I believe. It's, uh, you know, the only choice right now. Um, Zach, one of the things that we often hear in the United States is that Chinese in individuals really aren't very good at innovating. And that's one of the reasons they come to the United States. Is that your experience? And if so, how is China adjusting? Well, the Chinese education system specifically is not great at innovating, honestly. And, and, and you know, Jeremy just touched on this. Because there are so many students, you know, there's 9 million college graduates this last year in China. That's a lot of recommendation letters that you're, that you're reading from professors if you go that route, right? And so the test score ultimately is what defines a student's ability to get ahead and just a test score. So if you're the captain of the cheerleader team and, and trying to show leadership skills, that's great. You're wasting your time. You should be studying for the test. You're the, you're the best debater in the province. That's really, that's really sweet. And I'm glad that you, you know, you've gained those skills, but that might not help you get into a good college the same way it would here in the United States. So ultimately the studying and preparing for tests means that these students are often better bubble fillers than innovators. They're, they're better at test taking than necessarily creating. However, uh, for years, this has been recognized within the Chinese system as being a major uh, deficit within, within the education system. It's really hard to overhaul an entire education system. It's much easier to, to send students to a sort of tried and true system of, of creating innovation, and that's here in the United States. So, you know, we often ask, we, we think of the Chinese government as being relatively protective of the mental diet of the citizens, you know, what sort of information people are consuming. And yet every year, hundreds of thousands of often the wealthiest, um, the smartest, sort of the, the upper crust of Chinese society is being encouraged to come study abroad here in the United States. And that's because our education system is far better at creating a, a, a style of thinking that is ultimately conducive to innovation, which China desperately needs, again, going back to Dennis's question, to help get out of that, that real demographic trap. How do you create more value with fewer people in the workforce? So how many Chinese students have gotten a perfect score on the SAT, say, on a typical year? So we, we don't actually have specific data about this, but I personally have interviewed uh, about 10 different individuals who've gotten 2,400, um, and each year, or a perfect score on their SETs, and each year there's only about 500. So an incredibly large proportion uh, of perfect testers are coming out of China. Something to keep in mind, which, which always uh, you know, sort of blows my mind, they're doing it in their second language. So, I mean, you're talking about test takers who have come out of a, a, an ecosystem of competition that makes ours look like, you know, look like AAU basketball compared to the NBA. It's a, it's a real divide in testing ability. And they don't always get into the universities of their choice either. Well, this is what's so shocking. You know, for the book, I interviewed two uh, near perfect, one perfect and one near perfect test takers on the SAT, um, both incredibly motivated, well-rounded. Um, one had actually taken around 11 courses from Harvard. Um, he wanted to be an astronaut. And um, this was before he, by the way, he got into college. He was doing this all online in, in Sichuan province. Um, and yet he wasn't, he wasn't taken in. Um, he wasn't accepted into, into the school. I was actually uh, interviewing for Columbia at the time, or on behalf of Columbia at the time, he wasn't accepted. Um, and what you realize is that a lot of the best and brightest from China, um, because they're so good at test taking, the value of that test taking score is being diluted in the, in the eyes of um, recruiters and, and the admissions teams in colleges around the country. But the greater backdrop here, by the way, is competition. You know, the comp this, this student base in China um, who has, for the most part, been competing within China uh, over the next decade is increasingly going to be competing on the world stage. And so my question is, how, how prepared are your kids to compete at that level? Honestly, because it's something that as Americans, we have to think about critically. You know, that level of hard work competition is ingrained in this young generation in a way that I frankly haven't seen as much um, in my generation here in the United States. Yeah, and, and Zach, there's a, an, another part of that culture thing that is significantly different, and that's the concept of filial piety. I'd like you to tell that viewer what that is, and then I want to get Jeremy to respond to your comments. Filial piety is, is 
is a moral construct in China. Um, to be good in China is often to be um, a good son or daughter. So the word in Chinese is xiao shun. Um, it actually comes back to this idea of demographics. And Dennis, I'm glad you sort of set out this framework. Um, China's traditional retirement system was their kids. This is often, frankly, why there's so many, uh, traditionally so many children in a Chinese household. The idea was um, that you, you'd have more kids, the kids would look after you into old age. That of course was a lot easier when the life expectancy was lower. And so this, this idea of being a good son or daughter is hard baked into the Confucian moral system within China. Um, which to some degree or another still exists today. Um, and it absolutely drives uh, the consumer marketplace in China and the way that finance moves within, within a Chinese family. So you have young people being more willing to look after the older populations and the older populations being far more willing to invest in the educational futures of their kids. Okay, Jeremy, you got... Uh, this idea of filial piety. I, I noticed you shaking your head when he mentioned uh, yeah. the word and all that. H how does that look from your standpoint? And do you see things changing at all uh, with your generation? Well, my generation, for example, we still have the boundary or the burden of this pressure. You have to treat your parents and follow their disciplines. They just drew out and uh, for some parts, uh, I believe Chinese people more like Italian people, you know, the big family, the bigger the family is, the better it is, I believe. And, uh, but uh, I believe something will change uh, because, you know, for the generation like my, like me, uh, they got the education or the information from the Western countries. They may not like their, my kids to follow my rules or my path, you know? And uh, yeah, it may change gradually, but you cannot expect that immediately, I believe. Let me switch to politics for a minute and Zach ask you, what is the relationship between young China and, and the government and specifically the Communist Party? It, so it's, it's, a, it's a question, or excuse me, it's an answer that I think a lot of viewers won't necessarily like or necessarily empathize with. But one of the defining characteristics of this young generation is pride. Um, in 1990, the year that I was born and the year that a lot of my friends in China were born, um, China's per capita GDP was around 300 bucks, uh, poorer than India by, by a margin um, and amongst the poorest countries in the world. At that time, if there was an idea of a, a sort of US-China trade conflict, it wouldn't be a trade war it would be a trade bullying session. You'd have a, a, a hegemonic world power in the United States, more or less uh, you know, attacking uh, a fragile sick man of Asia, which is what China used to be known as. Now, in the last 30 years, there's been really one of the most incredible Cinderella stories in the history of capitalism and, and modern economics. You know, By the way, isn't it funny that the world's largest communist party has uh, has spurred one of the great capitalist revolutions and success stories in the last 30 years. And so this young generation has watched their village turn into a town, turn into a city. They've watched their country gain stature and prominence on the world stage. And while they recognize, by the way, that their, their government is flawed, often deeply flawed. We saw it at the beginning of COVID. It's the most um, vitriolic I've seen the young population towards the government in the last decade with the botched initial COVID reaction. Um, so they are recognizing the faults, but on the other hand, and you can even say on the back end of, of COVID, uh, they've seen that while their government is flawed, it's effective. It gets things done when it puts its energy behind it. And for the most part, they believe that it has its best interests mind in mind on the world stage. Yeah, Zach, that's a very good perspective. And let me uh, share with you the <clears throat> issue of how some of the Chinese students here looked at that. Uh, when Jim Falk was the uh, head of the World Affairs Council, he's now emeritus uh, World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, he interviewed Brigadier General Spaulding, who was one of the uh, most uh, effective and knowledgeable uh, defense sort of intelligence people who spent a lot of time in China. And he was very critical of the Chinese Communist Party. And I played, Jim, your interview with uh, General Spaulding in front of one of my classes. Jeremy, I'm not sure you were in that class. I don't remember. But I, 
I asked the students afterwards how they felt about our concern about the Chinese Communist Party and how they were living under something that is censorship and all those things. And yet uh, they, they told me basically that they recognized, as you said, Zach, that there were flaws under the system, but they and their parents are living a much better life than before. And so they were willing to accept that. Now, Jeremy, where do you stand on what he said and what I just related? I know what they request, and uh, I believe for some parts of the request is very reasonable. But uh, let me to uh, uh, obviously support them. It means trouble, I believe. So what I could do and I should do is that uh, keep quiet, uh, earn the money, work hard, and uh, pay the tax, and uh, hope someday our generation in charge maybe change some stuff. Hmm. Well said. Zach, Zach in, in your talking with students, is that pretty much what you would hear from others? Well, it's a mix. So, so there's 10% of the population in China that has a passport, only 10%, compared with 40% in the United States and 90% in, um, in the UK and Germany. So the proportion of sort of Jeremy's if I may, um, and of course Jeremy is his own person, but there is a certain representative quality to what I'm hearing. Um, there's a group of people who have been far more exposed to the outside world than others. And what we get for, from people who haven't studied abroad or traveled abroad is that many people treat the government like the weather. Uh, you can look at it, <laughs> you can uh, predict it to a certain extent, you can prepare for it, uh, but you can't change it. Uh, which, so, so you can sort of complain about it, but you're, not, you're, you're ultimately figuring out how to live within that system, which Jeremy sort of just referenced. Um, different than here in the United States because our government is participatory. We feel like we're constantly involved in it. We're talking about it all the time. In China, it's, it's often operating more in the background and it's not something that few people feel like they can change so they're not always butting heads with it. With that being said, there is a lot of questions about this young generation as they enter the party, as they enter the government, how much is that internal sort of new blood going to be shifting the party in the next, not just 10 years, but 20, 30, 40 years um, as inevitably Jeremy's generation will be will be changing sort of the 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 genetic makeup of of the CCP. Zach, primarily China's economy has been built on manufacturing. How is it going to evolve to a, a consumer economy? Well, there is a big shift to consumption right now, and and much different than in the United States. Consumption in China is actually being driven by young people. I often joke that in the U.S., even though we're sort of millennial obsessed. It might be millennials and Gen Z that make trends, but it's ultimately boomers that move markets. Young people in China are, are controlling a lot of the consumer clout, often being aided by their parents. And so global brands, Nike, Airbnb, um, Microsoft, Pixar, what have you, are when they're talking about the China market, they're really talking about the Chinese young market. Much of the opportunity rests in this under 40 demographic in China. Zach, there's so much attention now in the United States on the economic relationship and the growing military of China. In, in your view, what are we missing? What should we be focusing on? We're missing the people. And, and, I, and I say this, and it feels so obvious, but most of our conversations on, on China are about big government, which for many of us is scary. It's sort of, we have this uh, Cold War hangover where as soon as we hear communism, you know, it's a knee-jerk reaction. We kind of, okay, bad. Um, we also talk about big economy, which is exciting. You know, in my work, I talk with a lot of business leaders who are, you know, sort of chomping at the bit to understand that the Chinese market, specifically young people, by the way, who wield a lot of the economic clout. What we're missing in all of this is an understanding of people, which is why I'm so grateful you guys have Jeremy on today, because so often we don't, we're not interacting, we're not hearing, we're not talking about the concerns of, of people themselves. And I believe that a people first understanding of China, an understanding of the hopes, wants, needs, what keeps people up at night, what has them excited about their future, what they hope for themselves, their family, their country, that people first view, uh, will allow us to develop empathy. And empathy is not just, you know, fuzzy, wuzzy, feel good. Uh, it creates better business relationships, which creates better economic and political ties, uh, and, and, and quite literally creates uh, a far better world. And that to me is what's missing in the US-China relationship, 
a people first perspective of China for a better world. Yeah, thank you for that, Zach. And we just have a couple of minutes left. So very quickly, you write in your book about what freedom means to these young people. Explain that to our viewer. There are so many different types of freedom. And, and here in the United States, when we, when we sort of you know, tattoo freedom on our arms somewhere, uh, it, it, it's not really specific. Um, in China, young people dream about freedom. I, I actually do have friends who have tattooed it on their arm. I have a friend who wrote it on their ceiling. So it's the last thing they see every night and the first thing they see every morning. But rather than freedom from an oppressive and restrictive government, which is what we so often describe or imagine, it's often freedom from an oppressive and restrictive set of traditions, set of expectations from their, from their family. You know, Jeremy mentioned it before with, with real estate, getting ahead, um, getting married by a certain time, getting a job with a certain income. These expectations can often be crushing to this young generation. And, and so it's increasingly just freedom to, to live the life they want on their own terms. Jeremy, what would you like people to know about the relationship I believe the relationship should be keep the communication at the first, you know, as the one point once said, uh, no man is island entire of itself. Uh, so we have to keep an open mind to the outside world and uh, not be arrogant or, or some kind of exaggerate others' intentions and uh, learn some stuff, learn each other's good points, uh, try to figure out the way to live together. Well, I think that's a, a great way to close. And I want to wish you a, a safe return back to China. And we're so glad that you had such a good experience in, in the United States at University of Texas. Thank you. Thanks very much. You know, I think this was fascinating. We have done, as Dennis said in our open, so many programs on China. And it's great to, to have a different perspective. And if you've missed some of our other programs on China, please do go to mcquistontv.com. You can catch up on all those programs on China as well as others. And okay. please follow us on social media. And remember that we're here to bring perspectives that matter to people who care. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email Nikki N at nickymcquiston.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiantv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash TV or download McQuistian TV video podcast on iTunes. <laughs>